Mark Oswald, Chief Economy, CDM Investor Services. Good morning, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. So much to talk about. I'd like to um, kick off uh, with the non-farm payrolls. So this is the most relevant macro data for today, but certainly investors are uh, watching at the um, United States, all eyes on um, the election since we don't have the winner so far. Uh, what's your take on the data? Because we do see a little bit higher numbers compared to forecasts. Yeah, I, th I think actually they're quite encouraging from the sense that um, the uh, private sector payrolls, which ex excludes government jobs, which uh, took a big hit from um, the uh, wind down of census workers, uh, <clears throat> the uh, private sector payrolls, 906,000 with a, pr a revision up to the prior month. That's um, basically particularly encouraging as this is a month where the seasonal adjustment for seasonal hiring uh, ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday is actually quite harsh on the data. So there seems to be um, still quite strong labor demand despite the pickup in the infection rates. Average work week uh, up at 34.8. Uh, the, the only fly in the ointment here is that the underemployment rate or uh, those who would like to be working full time but are only working part time remains still very high, even though it came down from 12.8 to 12.1. But overall, a positive signal on the U.S. Uh, labor market. However, one always has to remember these these are numbers which are way above a, anything which is normal. Um, so even though it's coming down, um, one would have to say that basically the labor labor demand still is overall quite weak and could be weaker if we don't get a fiscal package. Um, and secondly, if um, there are further measures to try and re rein in the infection rate, which is obviously very high in the United States now. Yeah, it, it definitely is. When we talk about um, the elections, are you surprised? We, we already knew that there is going to be a delay. That's for sure because of the new uh, electoral system introduced because of the COVID. That's for sure. But three days is pretty much and you know, it's pretty stressful for everyone. Yes, um, uh, it was it was always going to be a, a protracted count. And I, I think it's something that people have to put up with. I think the more interesting aspect actually in respect of the election is for the time being, and one can't actually really make any concrete assertions on this, it does look like some sort of status quo. In other words, we have gridlock on Capitol Hill, i.e. in Congress. Um, and that basically renders whoever's in charge in, as, as president of um, um, as being a little bit less relevant. However, that may change because and we won't know the result of that until we actually get the special elections uh, in Georgia in January. Uh, so we're not really going to know what the next United States government is really going to look like for quite some time. More importantly, I think um, we obviously didn't have the blue wave uh, that everyone had been predicting and the polls had been predicting. Um, and we've come we've done a lot of backfitting of incoming data or incoming news about the election. Initially, Monday, Tuesday, we were rallying because there was going to be a big stimulus package. That's good for equities. Wednesday, Thursday, we suddenly changed the whole narrative and it became well, actually, gridlock's good because it means no one can go crazy. It's good for the tech stocks because it means no one's going to um, do anything which really damages the, the, the tech sector. Um, actually, I don't think actually any of that's true. I think that's backfitting. I think it really what it really tells us at the moment is the market is largely, particularly in the equity market in the United States, is a function of the, the short term um, the, the, the short term derivatives positions, options positions and traders basically hedging their positions. Um, and that's really what's been driving the market. I think last large part of that has now been unwound. Um, <clears throat> um, hence why we're setting a, a little bit of a setback today after the enormous squeezes that we had. Um, uh, but it really does tell us that actually the, the election news isn't really what is driving the market. Well, in fact, it is. And um, we saw a major rally in the past two days when it comes to Wall Street and also here in Europe. So how do you explain this decline that we are seeing today? Futures are down. Also, European markets are well below the flat line. Um, let's try to find a logic um, when it comes to the market's movement. 
Well, I think, first of all, it's Friday. We've had an enormous rally in um, in most of these equity markets, particularly things like the Nasdaq. Um, And there are probably a lot of people looking at um, the potential for all sorts of news over the weekend relating to politics and indeed infection rates and deciding to take some chips off the proverbial table. And I really think that's what it boils down to most of all. I think there will be also a little bit of concern because um, the payrolls data in a sense are a bit of a negative from the sense that if we see an improvement in labour demand as reported through this data, and we know it's not perfect, it doesn't really tell us what the picture really is on the ground, but it basically doesn't, it puts less pressure on Congress to deliver some sort of fiscal package by year end when a lot of people's entitlements will actually expire. And this is uh, basically a major, major deadline uh, for Congress. Um, So, but I think primarily the the reason for the downturn today is basically we've had a huge rally. Either people are taking profits or uh, there are some people just basically deciding to uh, pair their positions in the market ahead of the weekend. And that's a very typical pattern for a Friday. So um, I would like to um, talk about the Fed. The Federal Reserve said a coronavirus pandemic poses considerable risk for the U.S. economy despite recent gains, and officials made no changes to their commitment to provide sustained stimulus. A Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, said that they were monitoring two prominent risks to the recent rebound in economic activity, one from rising infection rates and another from households exhausting savings after earlier fiscal relief measures had dissipated. Uh, officials at their uh, September meeting pledged to support the recovery by setting a higher bar to raise interest rates and by signaling it expected to hold rates near zero for at least three more years uh, and not only uh, they um, this week fed officials continue discussions over how to provide more support to the economy should the reason rebound uh, fizzle according to uh, what um, jay powell said yesterday um, he was asked mo- mo- more than once about a possible change when it comes to their uh, quantitative easing and the, the bond acquisitions because christine lagarde already uh, mentioned a few days ago actually last week during the press conference that the ECB board is going to review their um, instruments all of them not just one so uh, Powell uh, was asked the same so he denied that the Fed is trying to review their instruments what's your take on that do you think the QE at this point is enough seeing that um, seeing that the Congress did not launch the second fiscal package Um, well the longer that we don't get a fiscal package, the more likely it is that the Fed is going to have to do something else. But one also has to make a distinction here between the ECB and the Fed, insofar as the Fed has a much wider um, pool of assets, which it is actually purchasing at the moment, uh, relative to the ECB. And therefore, uh, secondly, um, and this has been made clear by quite a lot of Fed speakers, not only Mr. Powell, um, There is no point in using up what is basically a limited pool of monetary ammunition when you've got financial conditions basically being stable. In other words, markets are working fine. Yes, we've had a bit of volatility, but we've already seen that tail off. Um, Interest rates remain low. Credit spreads have tightened back in again, having widened out a little. There is no point in the Fed doing anything. And I think that basically that is the message from the Fed at the moment. We'll not do anything more. We're definitely not going to take anything away, but we'll not do anything more unless we start to see uh, either a, a, a significant tightening of financial conditions or um, <clears throat> um, increased volatility in markets. Um, you know, that's really where they're at. And I think that's basically where where they're going to stay at for the time being. Um, They are basically, like most other central banks, looking at labor markets. And yeah, that is basically going to be the key going forward. You know, with the rise in the infection rates, you've got to ask yourself how many of these companies which are Deploy, you're either using um, the PPP payroll protection program, obviously that's expired in the States, or furlough programs, um, <clears throat> or short-term working 
programs that we've got um, in continental Europe, how long they can go on without basically having to start making permanent layoffs. And that's, I think, basically the key concern for a lot of central banks. At what point does this become, is the, the, is the economic damage from a second round of lockdowns, from a rise in the infection rates, from uh, the inability to basically get the, the virus under control, to what, to what extent is it going to in, um, create much more permanent damage in the way of permanent layoffs and what they could do there. They know that they, the one thing they can't do, uh, because you know, in that case, you would see a rise in the insolvencies and a rise in unemployment. And the one thing that central banks can't do is they can't print jobs and they can't they can provide a lot of liquidity, but they can't make corporate solvent. Um, you, you know, stock futures cut um, losses because of this um, major uh, data that we saw when it comes to the unemployment rate at 6.9 percent versus 7.9 percent, actually one percent in one month um, is a lot. So so do you believe that this is the actual unemployment rate? I mean, the real data that represents the labor market in the United States, and if not, where where does it stay, in your opinion? Um, I think it's really very difficult to gauge at the moment. I would suggest it's rather higher than that 6.9%. Um, um, However, I think the more important point is where do we have to get to for central banks to be, feel comfortable with uh, the labor market? And the Fed has basically said quite clearly, pretty much from the get-go, um, that uh, <clears throat> the unemployment rate needs to get back to where it was just before the uh, pandemic hit. So we're talking about sub-4%. We're still a very long way from there, a very long way. And I think that's something which needs to be borne in mind. Yes, it's encouraging that things have come down, but um, <clears throat> um, it's debatable uh, a, that they've come down as much as it says, because part of this is due to misclassification errors, uh, as we know. Um, um, and there are a lot of questions, basically, particularly if we start restricting movement of people uh, about whether there will be the uh, you will start to see more permanent layoffs coming through. Um, so, uh, Mark, I was wondering if we want to see um, the, who is going to be the, the, the new president, then we do see President Trump um, not taking it easily, specifically the results that uh, Biden uh, managed to get. And, and if there would be a political uncertainty in the United States, specifically in this particular moment uh, where there is an ongoing pandemic all around the world, what kind of impact um, can we imagine on the markets? Um, I, this is this is really a sort of a critical point for financial markets. On the one hand, they're financially oppressed and they will continue to be. That's basically the message from the central banks. We will carry on with this sort of policy for as far as the eye can see. Where we're going to be in three years time, heaven only knows, but that's what they're promising. Um, so. The markets are basically under, going to be under pressure to try and generate returns. On the other hand, um, they also have this tendency to look at political risk and say, well, you know, whatever the outcome, um, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, I, I think where, where the markets would come unstuck is if we actually see a protracted, drawn out battle over um, both over the Senate um, and indeed uh, the presidency, um, and signs of rising social tensions. I think that would actually be quite problematic. Um, but in the meantime, I think they'll still uh, basically take a so-called sunny side up view of uh, political developments. Um, they'd like to get it out of the way, but they understand that it's going to take some time. Um, but if this does get drawn out, say, like the... Um, uh, 2000 election, then things could actually get uh, rather more ugly, particularly as we go into year end and people basically want to shut down positions and close up um, and move to the sidelines. All right. Thank you very much. Mark Oswald, Chief Economist, ADM Investor Services. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thank you.